Well, I think the big news in Cuba is that there is a stained citizen uprising against the tyrannical regime, the totalitarian regime, which Cuba is suffering from. Since July 11th, 2021, thousands of Cubans have gone out publicly to protest against the regime, especially young artists, women, youth, demanding change, demanding the end of communism. They're fighting for their life and they're fighting for their freedom. And it's there, the videos are there, the political prisoners are there, hundreds of people have been arrested and imprisoned. Cuba has 122 women who are political prisoners. It's the country in the world with the greatest number of political prisoners per capita. And th there's a deep desire to change the regime. Why so many women? When you look at Cuban birth rates after communism took over, when you look at the level of exodus, over 200,000 Cubans have arrived in the U.S. since January of 2022. When you look at the collapse of infrastructure, at the collapse of the economy, they're killing that nation state. They're killing the, the Cuban nation. And I think that women perceive this uh, in, in a very intuitive and profound way. They know that their children, their families, their communities are being wiped out. And they've taken the lead in trying to save the country by organizing communities for civic resistance against the regime. You, you don't seem to hear a lot about this these days. I mean, there were these large protests over a year ago now, right, that, that, that did get some general coverage. But, you know, I think a lot of people today could be forgiven for not realizing even there's anything going on. There's been large protests taking place even after last year mm -hmm. uh, against the regime. This summer was full of protests throughout Cuba, but there seems to be a blackout, a literal blackout on what's going on in Cuba with the citizen defiance of the regime. Any thoughts on why that is? I think that uh, one of the main reasons is that Cuba is iconic to the left. Cuba is supposed to be the model of the successful socialist revolution, and it's not that at all. It's a highly repressive regime that has downgraded the lives uh, of Cubans, that has destroyed living standards in that country, that has created a crisis for, for the Cuban population. But that regime has a very good propaganda machine in its favor. And it's not just entirely Cuban, it's, it's also international. And the regime is the platform for the expansion of communist tyranny throughout Latin America, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Bolivia, and now perhaps also in Chile, in Colombia. This regime is essential for the spread of these ideas and of the creation of totalitarian uh, advocates throughout the, the, the hemisphere. So I think it's very convenient to many powers that be, Russia, China, and others here in the United States, that that regime uh, maintains the illusion of having been successful. Let's go back a little bit into history here. You know, you're the author of a, of a, of a wonderful book that I've been reading about Cuba. What was it like before the Re revolution, for example? I can say this. In 1898, when the Cuban-Spanish-American War ended, Cuba was devastated. Um, Cuba had been a very prof profitable colony for Spain because of sugar production and tobacco production. And the wars of independence resulted in 200,000 Cubans dying and the, the country's economic infrastructure destroyed. So the Cubans, the Cuban leadership, the Cuban independence leadership, which took over Cuba in 1902, after an American occupation, which was a very good occupation, did a lot of good for the country, uh, faced a country that was still in, in a dire state. Between 1902 and 10 years later, uh, 1912, 1922, the Cuban economy boomed. Cuban living standard, standards experienced uh, a spike in improvement and growth in literacy rates, uh, hygiene, uh, education. They all increased dramatically because to a great degree, Cubans put their best effort to rebuilding their country in freedom. There were political crises, um, there were conflicts between political parties, but the economy of the country, the social growth remained very steady and very even. And it was done within a model of trying to build a uh, rule of law within respect for individual freedom, respect for religious uh, spirituality and all its expressions. So Cuba grew very swiftly. What occurred was that there was a, an institutional and political crisis in the late 50s with the military government taking over. That led to an insurrection and Castro and his acolytes took control of the country with great support from American liberals um, in, every, in every way you can imagine. And the myth began to be constructed that this country had risen from a medieval state to great progress through socialism and communism, which is completely the, 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 
the opposite of what really happened. What happened was that a country that was, that was flourishing, that was about to take off in the development stage, collapsed under a communist regime. An excellent book that I read last year was called The Great Lady Wink by Ashley Rinsberg. And one of the things he talks about is how, you know, essentially a New York Times journalist, whose name escapes my, my mind right now, essentially made Fidel Castro into a hero. I mean, the guy was so pro-Castro and so pro-communist, he eventually was kind of fired. It was just, it was actually even too much for the New York Times. But, um, but apparently on his first visit to America, Fidel spent a, went back to the New York Times, spent a lot of time there and actually apparently thanked them for their apparent support. I, I don't even know what to make of that. Herbert Matthews mm -hmm. was essential in building the Castro myth. He went up into the mountains of the Sierra Maestra when Castro barely had 20 people following him. And they built that into that he already had, had an army of hundreds uh, for, for the consumption of the, U the U.S. public. So Herbert Matthews was very important. But that, that tour of the U.S. that you mentioned in 1959 by Castro, a public relations firm in the U.S. set that up. Who paid for that firm? Who paid for that tour of the U.S. by Castro? which presented him as a democratic reformist who was anti-communist and pro-American. All that was false. They were already building a communist state in Cuba. It's very obvious that the steps that were taken. And what they did with that trip to the U.S. and the work of Herbert Matthews was to somehow deviate attention from what they were really doing inside Cuba. I think the left needed a successful socialist revolution that didn't have any of the, of the stains of the bad uh, reputation Stalinism had already gained in the world. Remember, by 1959, uh, Khrushchev had revealed the crimes of Stalin at the Congress of the Communist Party, and the invasion of Hungary in 1956 had taken place, the crushing of the East German worker strikes. All that was in the air. People saw how repressive communism was. Then along comes this revolution in a tropical country uh, with some charismatic leaders promising utopia and heaven for Cubans. And they began to build from the very onset. Castro was surrounded by international advisors to help design that totalitarian state. And it's very clear in, Ge in Che Guevara's writings. The purpose of that was to create a platform through which to create a socialist revolution in the US and in Latin America. Through um, a combination of planning and preparation by the Cuban Communist Party and the US Communist Party and other left-wing forces, an opportunity that, that emerged, Cuba became the flag bearer for socialism in Latin America. Um, and I think that that's why to this day, there's still an attempt to protect that regime from any bad publicity it generates itself. Marcuse clearly states in his essay on liberation that the Cuban Revolution was essential for socialism in the, in the U.S. Um, and when you see that the role of that regime uh, since it took power, it's been a place to train U.S. left-wing activists, to indoctrinate, to create underground cells and espionage networks in the U.S., to facilitate throughout the region any kind of activity aimed at, at, uh, at opposing America's plans and at subverting democracies throughout the region. Not dictatorships, democracies. I mean, from the very onset, this regime wanted to, the Castro regime wanted to take over Venezuela uh, to the point that they even sent armed invasions throughout the 60s. Uh, and, and the same thing was repeated in key countries which they thought were essential to creating a united Soviet socialist uh, republics of, of Latin America. And of course, to also to also cause social tension, class struggle, and radical transformation of the United States. That's always been in the plan. It's always been part of, of what the regime, and they don't hide it that much, of what the regime states, of what it pursues. And what got me started on my book was when I found a long dialogue between Che Guevara and left-wing journalists that took place in New York City in 1964 uh, at the Cuban mission. And it was extremely revealing of what Guevara was seeking and of what these so-called journalists were also seeking. So what, what is it that was what it revealed? Well, it revealed to me uh, the, band, the madness of Guevara, of Che Guevara, a man bent on his own vision of, of what the revolution should be and how to bring about socialist transformation, and also recognizing the great disasters they were causing. But at the same time, these journalists who are all born in the U.S., are citizens of a free republic, they're urging him on. You know, they're, they're creating the myth and putting that into Guevara's mindset as they interview him. It's obvious they're using the Guevara to push the idea of a socialist revolution and Guevara thinks he's using them to consolidate that, that regime. To me it was fascinating of the, of the relationship between so-called progressives, so the woke ideology, and hardline, radical, dangerous people like Ernesto Guevara.